my name is Yulia Startsev, uh, and as maybe you see from the title slide, I have an art degree. I don't have a design degree. They are very different disciplines. I am so sorry about the, the design of the slides, but they're all hand drawn. Uh, so I work at Mozilla. Um, I do a couple of things there. I uh, um, I work on DevTools, which is a really interesting place to work because we think about how do people find problems, how do they solve problems, um, how do we help them solve their problems, how do we help them learn about their code. I also work uh, as a delegate to TC39, which is the committee which designs JavaScript. And there we think about what's the user interface, the human computer interface that the language provides to programmers to allow programmers to express themselves uh, through programming. Now, this talk uh, is coming from a workshop that I did a year ago, maybe two year, years ago at Socrates. Uh, Socrates uh, has a form of a bar camp, and um, basically you propose a topic, and people are like, oh yeah, I totally want to learn about that, and then they go and join your topic. I proposed to teach people how to draw, and specifically how to draw observationally rather than symbolically. It's a specific type of drawing. And people came, and they really enjoyed it, and they were like, wow, that was a really interesting experience. Like, I didn't expect to have that experience. But why teach programmers to draw? Like, what's the benefit of teaching programmers to draw realistically? What's going on there? And, uh, you know, I didn't actually have a specific answer pre-baked for this. I hadn't thought about this question. Maybe I should have. But uh, I, I had a reason. I had a motivation for, for doing this. Uh, and it takes multiple forms. One of the very first ones is that programming and drawing, they're both about representation in the end. We're representing information as programmers around a business case. And as artists, we might be representing something that we've experienced, or maybe we are representing something about the history of the world or something else. But we're generally working with representation in both cases. Now, drawing is a very physical thinking process. Um, there is a relationship between looking, seeing through the eye, thinking, and then transferring that to the page. And this reminded me of a really interesting book about tennis. Now, this book was written by Timothy Galloway, and it's called The Inner Game of Tennis. He, um, it was in the 1970s. Everything interesting happened then. Uh, and what he did is he uh, discovered a way to teach people to play tennis uh, in about 20 minutes. Uh, people who hadn't been moving around, like someone who hadn't been doing any kind of exercise for 20 years, was uh, he was able to teach her tennis. And his method was as follows. What he would do is he would throw the ball and tell his student to, say, bounce when it hits the tennis court. And when the racket, when the student's racket hit the ball, he said, say hit, make it vocal, vocalize it. Uh, and he would gradually like build up a practice of getting the student to pay attention to something, to pay attention to the sound of tennis, to pay attention to the elegant arc of the, of the ball flying. And somehow, suddenly, the student was like playing tennis. In fact, there's this one section where he's teaching her how to serve, and he says, just hum the sound of the ball going up, and then hit it. Just go, mm, tsh, and just keep repeating that sound. And he said, uh, actually, it wasn't him, it was Alan Kay, uh, who uh, took a look at this and said, holy cow, that's the direct quote from Alan Kay, holy cow. And he said, wow, that, that's amazing, that's an amazing way to teach. He started thinking about it, and he was thinking about it in relation to user interfaces. And he said, um, what's going on here is that, you know, the part of your mind that knows how to play tennis doesn't speak English. And that when you're trying to learn, uh, the way that tennis used to be taught is you'd be told, like, you know, have your elbow like this, move your hand like this, and, you know, it's all explained to you, all of the pieces through language. And he says, you know what, that part of your brain, it doesn't, it doesn't speak English. Your mathematical part of the brain doesn't necessarily speak English. There's so many parts of your brain that are nonverbal, but you're able to interact with. Now, actually, um, just before I got on stage, I was thinking about another, uh, another funny situation, because we'll get into this a little bit later, where um, there was a doctor, his name is escaping me at the moment, and uh, he had patients who had uh, amputated arms, and there's this uh, condition called phantom limb. It can be painful, it can be very, very painful. The, the arm's missing, but you can still feel it, and it's clenched, and it's really, really painful. What he did is he put a, a mirror 
in front of that arm just to see if they could release it. And you know, when the, when the patient saw the mirror and it was reflecting their arm and they're like, oh, doctor, my arm is moving. It's like, oh, fantastic, okay, is it painful? No, no, it's great, it's just moving. Just from the visual input of seeing uh, their hand in place again, it released the tension of it clenching. Eventually, um, things got confused and the arm just disappeared, but that's another story. So um, let's talk about learning and learning and seeing and what seeing can do for us. Uh, I didn't learn through the method that I introduced at the workshop. The method I introduced was created by someone named Betsy and Betty Edwards, and we'll take a look at her in a second. The way that I learned, I learned through tracing. I, uh, I wanted to be an artist, so I was like, I'm gonna trace, and I really like drawing eyes. So I was tracing an eye one day, and I had done part of it, like, it's a little hard to see, but what I'd done is I'd taken the line and I'd carried it around the eye, and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, it's a nice line, it's gonna look great, this is gonna be a great tracing. And then I did the second line of the eyelid, and it went below like this. And I, I just had this sudden realization. I was like, wait a second. Eyelids have thickness? Oh my god, I didn't realize eyelids had thickness. I had always been representing eyes as having just like two lines, and then like the iris and everything. It was a symbol, I was drawing almost like a letter. I wasn't drawing what I was seeing. I wasn't even looking at what I was seeing. And then suddenly by tracing, I was actually looking and I was actually, you know, it was a purely mechanical uh, task. And lots of people look down on tracing. They're like, oh, tracing, you're not, really, you're not really drawing if you're tracing. But by distracting your mind and giving yourself a purely mechanical task, your mind is still active. It's still learning things. And that was what happened for me. And I did the same thing when I was learning how to code. So I would actually take, in fact, I'm doing it right now. Um, I have a new project that I'm going to be starting on, and it just started, so I'm just a little bit behind. The project started about a month ago. And what I'm doing is I'm going through all of the commits and I'm re-implementing them and just tracing the code base in order to understand what's going on. There's a lot of new concepts for me, and this is a way for me to um, get introduced to the concepts not necessarily directly intellectually, but just through this mechanical action and discovering things as I go. Now, this wasn't the method that I introduced because uh, it's not so exciting to be like, okay, now you should trace and it's all gonna be fine. And it, it doesn't make people feel like they own the drawing. It doesn't make them feel like they were directly responsible for it. Uh, so the method that I introduced, um, oh, sorry. The, Miss the slide. Uh, so people, when they start drawing, uh, they usually start by drawing through language. They draw through symbols. So when they're like, I want to draw a person, what they draw is they draw symbols of what makes up a person, the, the parts that constitute a person. The eyes, the nose, the mouth, hands. Hands have five fingers. Also, if you look at children's drawings, they're usually uh, drawing using language. They're drawing in a way that uh, they describe what they see, rather than drawing what they see, and rather than necessarily directly looking at what they see. So uh, again, let's go back to this concept of drawing as a physical process, and look at it through the eyes of Betty Edwards, and drawing on the right side of the brain, which is a book that she wrote in the 1970s. Everything interesting happened in the 1970s. Uh, and she had a lot of really interesting exercises in this book, and I went through a couple of them in this workshop. Um, so we mentioned how people are drawing linguistically, and they're drawing from things that they already recognize, things that are close at hand. So what she had people do is she said, look at the palm of your hand. Now I want you to draw, without looking at the piece of paper, I want you to draw the lines of your hand. And I just want you to focus on being as accurate about drawing the lines of your hand as you can, and then look at the piece of paper when you're done. Not while you're doing it, only when you're done. And people would be like, oh, but it doesn't look like anything. And she's like, yeah, 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 that's the point. What you need to practice is actually looking at what, what your subject is rather than doing what you think you should be doing. So that's the first exercise. And then the second exercise has to do with drawing anything but the object, drawing the air around the object. And that's um, a little difficult to see, so let's look at the next one. Uh, so uh, this is an example of negative space drawing. You draw the air around the object, and you probably recognize what it is. You recognize that it's a chair. Now, this is a drawing, once you start drawing a lot, it, it does get a little harder to go directly into symbolic mode, but this is a drawing of a chair that's done without like directly looking at it and sort of digging into my head and being like, what do I think a chair looks like? Whereas that's uh, observational. This is what, a ch what the chair in particular that I was looking at looked like. Uh, 
And you probably notice, that you'll, if, if you do this exercise, unfortunately we can't do it all together because of the format. You're all sitting there and I'm standing here and talking. Um, but um, if you try this, and I recommend that you do try it, you'll notice something really, really interesting going on. You'll notice that your recognition of the object is delayed. You don't recognize the object until later. Like here, I mean, uh, you're probably like, these are shapes. Oh, no, 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 that one's an orange. That's the kind of like shock that you get. You're like, oh wait, now I see what it was. You knew intellectually what, what you were looking at, but as you were drawing it, the recognition was deferred and then you named it. Just like we have this uh, list of things that we can name about the body and then put on a page, now we have this um, different kind of knowledge which comes directly from observation. We've observed things, for example, we've observed this particular lip of the, of the chair, and it's like, okay, now we know something about the chair that we can add as a feature, and now we can name it. Naming things, difficult in programming. Um, when we're talking about naming things, like we can name things in many, many different ways. This is a rose, right? A rose by any other name. But observation plus naming gives us analysis. So we could just take what we already know. We could take the symbols we already know, use the names that we already know. But we can also use observation, just like we observed the lip of the chair, and then we can take our capacity to name and to break things apart, to pull things apart, and uh, start looking at how we can name things. Now, there are two strategies of naming that we can take a look at. One of them is called splitters, or reductionism, and the other one is lumpers, or holism. Splitters look for the differences. And when we take a look at a rose, and we break it apart, we've suddenly got instead a flower, a thorn, a leaf, a stem. And it's broken up into the parts that, constitu that constitute it. Whereas lumpers would be like, it's a flower. Those are all flowers, right? And they would uh, rather see similarities between things rather than differences between things. And these are two, two different strategies to name. But the lumpers sometimes, they go a little, a little too far, right? Like, what's the similarity here? What, what's, what's the same about a rose and a fish? Well, there's a metaphor in there somewhere, uh, specifically that they both have thorns and they're both spiky and you probably wouldn't want to grab one without being a little bit more careful. Um, and you might say, like, okay, so now we're getting into the realm of poetry and we're getting into the realms of ar realm of art, but arguably this has a strong correlation in science. For example, what's the similarity be between these two things? Now, the details are a little bit washed out, but we've got a bat here and we've got a pigeon. What the heck's the similarity here? Well, of course, it's convergent evolution. They both uh, evolved to have flight in completely different ways, and their systems of flight are completely different. Of course, the lumpers, you know, the splitters are going to be like, okay, okay, this is, this is fine, this is, this is a good direction, this is scientific. But then the, the lumpers are like, but that one's a flying rat and that one's a flying fox. And then suddenly things are just getting mixed up and nothing makes any sense anymore. Now, there's this great text from Borges uh, called The Analytic Language of um, Thomas Wilk. I think, <laughs> uh, and there's this list, and you're gonna recognize it in some of the code bases that you've worked on. There's a list of everything in the world, and it's called the Celestial Empire, uh, Emporium, sorry, not Empire, of Benevolent Knowledge, and it includes, as part of its list, things that belong to the emperor, embalmed things, tamed things, sucking pigs, sirens, fabulous things, stray dogs, things that were included in, this pre in the present classification, and frenzied things, innumerable things, drawn with a fine camel brush, etc. so everything outside of the list, having just broken a water pitcher, and from a distance it looks like flies. Now imagine, you, you probably have a code base where some of the definitions weren't quite like correctly split and cut, especially in, uh, in code bases that have evolved for a long time. So this is, this, uh, it's really interesting how we get to this point, how we get out of this point, how we think about this, because this isn't necessarily bad, this is language. There's a great book called uh, Fire, Women, and Other Dangerous Things, which talks about how language makes exactly these kind of groupings. So it brings us to kind of a funny point, like what, what do we do with this kind of classification? So to talk about that, I'm gonna take a step back and I'm gonna talk about mental modes. 
There's two, uh, this comes from Barbara Oakley. She has a really great book, Learning How to Learn. It's also a uh, Coursera series if you want to ch check it out. And, she, uh, and she's done like multiple videos about this. She talks about focused and unfocused mental modes. Uh, you might have heard of this as system one and system two. And uh, unfocused actually has multiple subtypes, so does focused. Uh, but we're going to start off defining what focused means. And we're going to define how do we actually gather information, how do we learn things. The focused mind looks something like this in the way that, in the metaphor that she uses. It's like a pinball machine. And when you have a thought, when you start thinking, there's like, it's like a pinball has been shot up and it starts bouncing around really tightly inside of a part of your brain. Now, let's say you want to you want to connect it to some problem here, and you're like having a problem getting to that point because the the pinball machine is too tight. Another aspect of the focused mind is that it has multiple um, storage points that it can use. We used to think that this was seven because people were like, "Oh, I can remember seven numbers of a phone number," so obviously we've got seven storage points in our brain. But now it looks more and more like it's four. And the way that these work is they'll connect to some part of the knowledge in the brain and pull it up and be like, okay, we're thinking about this, we're thinking about that, we're thinking about this other thing, etc. Also, this is why if you're multitasking, you basically like lose one of those four, so you're like 25% less efficient. Um, and what's really interesting when we, is when we take a look at a child learning, uh, we can see some interesting things going on in the brain. Now, uh, I have an example of this. I recently saw this because I was uh, spending some time with my friend, and she has a young six-month-old baby boy. And this baby was sitting there and being like, I'm just going to get this star-shaped thing into the square. Like, it's definitely going to fit. And it, the, the kid was like turning it every which way, trying to figure out how they were going to fit this, this star shape into a square. And, you know, what's going on in that kid's brain is just like these four things are going crazy. These four memory slots, because so far the kid has, for us it's obvious, like it's a different shape kid. Of course it's not going to fit. But for the, for the child it's like, oh no, I can't. there's something like inherent about these two objects. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out what this inner truth of these two objects are. And it's going crazy and it's trying to figure things out. Now, some of you might have uh, got this joke. Uh, if you didn't, this is... Uh, a combinatorics equation. Um, and if you're aware of combinatorics, this is when you uh, check different combinations of things. Uh, but I put that up there because I want to talk about how we get jokes as well. So how do we understand problems? Or rather, how do we understand jokes? Is our brain's going crazy trying to figure out what the pattern is of how two things fit together. And we're trying to put them together and we're trying to fit them. And once we do get it, it gets chunked. And our brain recognizes that as a pattern. And we can be like, oh yeah, I, I heard that joke before. I know how it goes. Totally. Oh, yeah, I've seen that equation before. I know how that goes. Totally. Oh, yeah, I've seen that problem in that code base before. I know how it goes. Totally. No problem. And it's a very easy thing to do. Whereas, you know, when you're trying to figure it out, or maybe, you know, you're watching somebody else try to figure it out, and they're like, oh, I can't figure this out. This star thing's not fitting into the square. Uh, their brain's going crazy when you've already got it chunked. Now, there are two basic types of problems. Problems you understand, problems that you don't, kind of. There are three basic types of problems. Problems you understand, problems you don't understand, and the ones that you think you understand but you don't. Or rather, there's really just this one. We all think we understand the problem, but in reality, not so much. So let's talk about how that happens. Like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we kind of matched a pattern maybe, and we're trying to figure out how to move forward, but something's going wrong. What's happening when we think we understand something and we have, the only moment we realize that we don't is when we have evidence against it, just like the kid trying to fit things and then it doesn't fit. So we're going to talk about two specific parts of that question, abstraction and representation, problems of abstraction and problems of representation. Starting with problems of representation. So uh, you can represent things in a lot of different ways, and they can mean completely different things. Like here we have a very difficult to see photo of a cat, and there you can like totally see the cat, right? Like, there's a fluff ball, you're not sure what it is, and then here it's like, okay, it's obvious, it's got two eyes and a mouth, it's definitely a cat. Uh, and there's, uh, when it, we come to the point of talking about representing information, there's this great uh, piece of prose, it's very short, it's one paragraph long, from uh, Jorge, um, uh, Borges. Uh, sorry, I just switched to the Spanish reading and now, <laughs> now I've thrown myself off. Um, on the exactitude of science, 
This, uh, this goes a little bit like this. So um, it's about a country whose highest priests are cartographers. They make maps. And uh, they start making more and more accurate maps of the country to the point that the maps grow to the size of the country. And they uh, are so specific and so fantastic and so huge, they just take up ridiculous amounts of space. And then like the next generation is like, oh, the map is wrong. And then the next generation is like, y you know, we're not really into this map that's taking up all this space. So in the end, this map, these maps just end up thrown off uh, on the horizon like mountains of clutter, just these uh, leaves left from the past. We can't have exactitude because if we make an abstraction too detailed, it'll take up the same amount of space as the thing that we're trying to describe. And there's a really great quote from, I forget the scientist at the moment, but I can definitely look it up for you. Uh, the map is not the territory, and this is coming from, um, I believe it was a geologist, where they say that an abstraction has a specific use, and uh, the representation of something has a specific use. We want to show specific features. And we can see this in the different ways that maps can be represented. Each one of these is um, distorting Greenland. Just, just keep an eye on Greenland. Greenland at the very top is like completely stretched out and weird. Greenland here is split in half, and who knows what's going on with it here. And Greenland here is just a small, scrunched up thing. So when we're looking at these maps, you know, maybe you didn't know that the Earth was a globe, and you're looking at these maps trying to find out the truth of Greenland, and you're like, well, Greenland just changes shape all the time. The thing about... Um, representations is that you can take the same concept and represent it in a different way. So if one representation is throwing you off and making you think like, oh, that doesn't really make any sense, I don't understand how that's working, then trying to re-represent it is an interesting way to go. Now, uh, as an example, I want to take uh, something from genome assembly and uh, also graph theory. You don't need to know graph, graph theory. Uh, we're going to be talking about something that you might have heard of, which is called the Königsberg Königsberg bridge problem, where the goal was, a bunch of philosophers were thinking like, how do we uh, walk around Königsberg so that we visit every single bridge once, and there were seven bridges. Um, so that's, just keep that in mind, we're going to be coming back to it. Now, the genome reassembly problem, and this is very low contrast, but you can see these little smudges of dirt, that's what we're talking about. And I'll, I'll try to be there for the smudges. Now, uh, genome re reassembly is, say, you have a couple, you have a genome that you want to assemble with several letters, and you're doing reads of it. So you read the first three letters, and in this case, we're going to say it's TCA. And then you can continue to read groups of three with overlaps of two letters. So you've always got an overlap of two letters, uh, but uh, you don't ever read the full genome in one go. So that's the problem that we're dealing with. Now, we end up with a bunch of, like, imagine just pieces of paper that you need to reassemble, and you know that there is likely an overlap of the first two letters with two letters of another string. So there's one way to represent this, which is each string is a node on a graph. And you want to solve this by uh, traversing the graph and figuring out what the overlap is. So uh, you're like, OK, we've got TCA to start with. Uh, we've got two CA nodes. Again, last two letters, first two letters. So let's draw the graph that would complete this. And you know, eventually, you'll find a path through this. Uh, but it'll take, you know, maybe it'll take a long time. It might be a guess and check situation. You'll be like, oh, I'm not too sure. And you're going to try multiple times. And then you'll be like, oh, this is impossible. Or you'll find a, a, a real solution. Uh, there is a solution to this one. Um, this is coming from the University of San Diego, this example in particular, by the way. There's a, there's a uh, comment in the slides. So uh, eventually we visit every single node, because that was our goal in the end. We wanted to visit every single node and reassemble the genome. But this is something called, um, well, it doesn't matter what it's called. This is a really difficult problem to solve. We don't have any efficient algorithms to solve this problem, as long as we're thinking of our goal being to visit every single node. But what if we represent the problem differently? This is what we're talking about, changing our representation to help us understand the problem, to help us understand the abstraction that we're working with. Now, rather than representing each string as a string, we represent it as an edge. So we have CA going to AT. And you might be like, well, how the, how the heck is that going to help us? Well, it changes the graph quite a bit. So as you see here, this is a much simpler graph. Uh, 
And now our goal is no longer to visit every single node once, our goal is to visit every edge once. And we end up having something like this, so uh, the CA node is visited three times. This is the Königsber Königsberg bridge problem, and we have an efficient algorithm for this. Uh, and this, w this work was done by de Bruijen and a few others. Uh, it was done re relatively recently. My memory is failing me at the moment. Uh, but basically, when we talk about the impact of representation, this is it. Uh, we go from an NP, a non-polynomial time problem, to a P problem. I think that's fascinating that we can switch representation like this. Uh, that representation can give us such, uh, such an insight into a problem. So you may have heard this saying, if you're not sure you understand a problem, try rephrasing it. A problem is also a kind of abstraction that you can rephrase to understand it better. Uh, another really interesting example that comes from my work is um, I have a colleague, uh, David Barron, and uh, he often has to deal with like really important um, reviews. For example, we have chem spill releases. A chem spill release is when uh, at Mozilla we have something that needs to go out and it has to work. It has to work correctly. For example, a security fix. A security fix for something that is publicly known and we have to get it fixed right away. What he does is he's, he, he has several steps to his review process. Um, but the one that I want to bring up here is that when he's given the okay to the PR, he's like, this PR looks good to me then he will go and re-implement it from memory as he understood it. Then, after he has both of them side by side, he does a diff between them and sees what the difference is between these two. And when he does this, he's found issues in the PR that he, when he read it, he was like, yes, this is correct. But then when he did it, he was like, wait, I understand this much better now. This is wrong, we need to fix that. So that's another interesting technique that we can use that directly applies to coding. So let's come to the point of talking about problems of abstraction. So this isn't about how something is represented, it's what we've got in our head and what we're working with, how we understand problem, how the chunk has formed in our memory, and how it interrelates with evidence, particularly when we have evidence that what we think is wrong. Or we think, oh, I have evidence, for example, you're working on a bug and you're like, that should be impossible. This should not be possible. And this becomes sort of a stop. You're like, for, this shouldn't be possible. I don't know what to do with that. Uh, and maybe you start looking around and you discard things because you think that they should be impossible. This is, this is what I'm talking about when I say uh, evidence doesn't support the abstraction. Before we get really deep into that, we need to understand that we have emotional relationships with our ideas. So we feel strongly like, for example, maybe there's a bug or maybe someone gives you a pull request and you're like, Ugh, that's wrong, that's totally wrong. There's an emotional reaction, and it's not rational. Actually, I, I was reading a really interesting uh, response from John McCarthy to a person he clearly didn't like very much, uh, and uh, he was really like, you know, tearing it apart with a rational argument. Like he was like, "This is wrong. That is wrong." For all these reasons, and, at the, and I was thinking, like, you know, we have the benefit of hindsight, so we can see that the things he was he was saying were wrong. But um, at the very end of this angry letter, he says, and he misquoted me. And there was, there was a clear emotional reason for him to actually tear apart this person's idea that wasn't rational. He probably was like, I'm being totally rational here and the guy's just an idiot and he misquotes me. But there's also an emotional impetus to tear that apart. And we have to be careful about that because we're emotional human beings. We feel things very deeply. So that also brings me back to the, the question that we started this talk with. Why teach programmers how to draw? Because they say, I can't draw. And uh, just like other people say, I can't do math. And these are really interesting statements because they're statements about themselves and about their capabilities. I want to move to, there's a really interesting story that illustrates this in a nice way, which also uh, it comes from the Hidden Brain podcast and it's called Me, Myself and Ikea. It's looking at the phenomenon of Ikea and what Ikea does to us and makes, uh, what it makes us feel. Um, specifically, it's, a, it's an interview with a psychologist, Daniel Mohan, um, where they were looking into this and, you know, Ikea says our furniture is cheap because you have to assemble it yourself. But Mohan was like, well, actually, I think they might be doing a bit of a psychological thing there. What he did is he wanted to test it. So uh, he, ha he took one group of participants and he said, here's a bunch of Lego and I want you to assemble a Lego car with that Lego. 
participants were like, yeah, okay, sure. And then the other group of participants were just given a Lego car. And we're like, oh, play around with it, like move it around, get used to it, feel like it's yours. And then he asked, how much would you pay to keep your car? It's a Lego car. Like, you know, these are all adults being tested. And, uh, you know, everybody was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. The people who got the Lego car that wasn't built would pay 50 cents for it, whereas the people who built their own Lego car were like, I'm going to pay a euro for that. Yeah, it's a damn good car. Like, hell yeah. <laughs> And it's like, what's going on? What's going on there? Like, it's it's Lego. Like, you can go to the store and buy it. Like, why is it suddenly more valuable because you built something with it? Well, that, it's 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 an emotional based thing because what do you value other than being competent? And one thing that we do also with IKEA, also with these Lego carts, is we want to show people that we're competent, that we can build stuff that we can make things. And it's really interesting, like, um, if you do the same experiment, but before you uh, give them the Lego, you make them solve a really hard math problem, the people who have to build the car out of Lego will value it even more. <laughs> and if you ask them this question, what do you value other than being competent? What do you value about yourself that's more important to you than being good at something? And you get them to really think about it, the price changes, and they start costing the same. This is sort of this is the impact that emotion has on us, and we, it's something that you know you might not always be aware of, but if you can name it and you can be like, you know what, I'm actually the thing that's driving my reaction here is actually something that I can name and that I can control and that I can modify. Then it's not just this nebulous thing that you don't have any access to. You actually have access to it. You can change it. Um, in fact. Uh, around this topic of competency, I found this really interesting tool while I was in art school. Uh, we would be given prompts all the time, and eventually you get tired of getting art school prompts. And um, one day, uh, our teacher was like, you know what, no one ever shows up and wants to do worse. I was like, that's a good idea. <laughs> I'm going to see what the worst solution is that I can come up to this problem. And it became a really powerful tool because when you start to generate bad solutions, you don't have this hang up of like, oh, I'm, I'm afraid of not showing that I'm competent. Like, you never actually directly think of it. You feel that. Uh, but if you put yourself into a situation or you ask yourself, what do I value other than being competent? Or, I mean, this is one specific emotion we're looking at. There's many others. There's many other ways to think about emotion. Uh, then you can actually start moving yourself away from that, changing your feelings about it. Let's go back to that example about the people with the, phantom, the very painful phantom limbs and how when you just put a mirror there and they see that there's a hand there, they knew intellectually that, that the hand was gone. But seeing it being back allowed them to ungrip the hand. Our minds are not purely linguistic things. There's more going on there. There's other types of thinking involved. So let's continue on with the problem of abstraction. We started with this thing of like, what if your abstraction is wrong and you hit a contradiction? Okay, so for the first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna be like emotionally involved there. But, uh, and there's a really great story here from Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, how do we deal with things being false? And uh, Kurt Vonnegut has this interesting story in The Sirens of Titan uh, in Kronos and Clastic Infundibula. Uh, it's, it's a beginning of a, of a chapter, and it's sort of presented to you as a story from a kid's book. And the kids are being told, like, imagine your daddy is the smartest daddy on the planet. He says something is true. Now imagine that there is another little child on another planet somewhere, and their daddy says, well, that thing is false. But the, both daddies are correct on their specific planets. Now, if you bring them together onto a planet where they're both, cor both correct, then you have this this specific uh, phenomenon. And I looked this up, but these are all real words. <laughs> but I forget what they mean now. <laughs> I believe synclastic means all points leading to the same, uh, to the same point. Um, so allowing false things to be true is a really interesting place to start. Because when you say that, OK, this thing goes against everything I believe, and this, can, this is not just for programming. This is for everything. You know, you're hit with a piece of evidence, and you're like, this goes against absolutely everything that I believe. and uh, I was also having a really interesting conversation with a friend of mine, and he said, you know, maybe you disagree with someone who has a lot of, a lot of feeling about something. And uh, one way to think, one way to empathize with them is to, to say what must be true in order for them to think that way. Uh, what world are they maintaining? Like, for example, with strong social issues, like what world are they maintaining? What are they protecting? Uh, 
with these ideas. Uh, it can give you a really interesting insight of empathy that way. But also, we can take a look at something like this, which is 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. Well, that's false. And you're like, no, no, that, that's false. Like, what are you talking about? 1 plus 1 totally equals 2. And then, you know, you start looking more and you start thinking about, well, what if we set that to true? What if we say that that is possible, that is true? And then we have this other example. And then suddenly it clicks. You're like, well, we're talking about decimal and binary and we're talking about number bases. So this is something where you have a thesis, you have an antithesis, and you have a synthesis. And uh, the synthesis is something that unites two contradictory ideas. A synthesis doesn't necessarily have to unite two contradictory ideas, but it's extremely powerful when you are faced with a contradiction, when you're faced with something that breaks your mental model of the world, to consider what's the synthesis that would allow these things to be possible. But this is very, very hard. This is famously hard. In fact, normally we're taught analysis over synthesis as a, as a technique because uh, analysis is something that's easier to grasp. Synthesis is much more difficult to teach. So let's come back to this point of understanding mental modes, and let's take a look at the focused and unfocused modes. So this was the focused mind, and here's the unfocused mind. It's got much more spread out nodes. You're not doing like really fine-grained thinking. You're not solving like specific mathematical problems in this mode. You're walking around, you're watching a movie, you're being entertained, you're bored, something. And again, let's take a look at the focus mind and how it makes connections. You've got these four memory slots, and they're going and attaching themselves to some specific ideas that you're holding in your mind. The unfocused mind operates a bit differently. It instead has nodes making connections between each other and rearranging them. And this can be really powerful if you don't stop yourself from rearranging those nodes. Like you don't stop yourself from thinking, oh, no, no, no that's false. I'm not going to think about that. No, no let, you, let yourself think about false things. Because, you know, it's all in your head. Like no one's going to judge what's going on in your head. You're allowed to do thought experiments. You're allowed to build systems that are unproductive, that are unuseful. How do we use this unfocused state? Because it's extremely powerful. You've probably heard of uh, people being like, um, you know, I, I, I was solving this difficult problem and then I got on a train and I was watching the, the trees go by and suddenly the solution came to me. Or, for example, like there's, a, uh, there's an anecdote that Barbara Oakley uses of uh, Dali, Salvador Dali. He would be working on a painting, an abs a surrealist painting, and he'd get stuck, he'd go and sit in his chair, he'd completely relax, and he'd have keys in his hand, and when he was just falling asleep, his hand would relax so much that the keys would drop and he'd wake up and then he'd go back to the painting. And he also says it wasn't just, it wasn't just artists who were using this. There was also uh, uh, Thomas Edison did the, did the following. When he was stuck on a problem, he would go and sit in his chair and he'd relax completely, except instead of keys, he had barbells in his hand and when he fell asleep, those fell and they, they woke him up and then he went back to his problem. So uh, people tap into the unfocused mind but the important thing is that we're talking about something that's unproductive in the usual sense. And it's important to be able to be unproductive. In fact, this talk has largely been based around techniques that dance across this line of productivity and unproductivity. Like when we talked about tennis. And tennis, this tennis example, was essentially distract the verbal mind, distract it so that it's looking somewhere else, and let the, the mind that isn't verbal go and do its thing. We talked about it when we talked about why teach programmers how to draw. We want people to focus on something and then let the unconscious mind do the rest. It's something that we do all the time. We switch in between these all the time. Which brings me to another interesting example. This one comes from the realm of studying parenting. How do we raise children? And the idea is there's basically two ways to raise kids. One is as a carpenter, where you have a plan, and you're like, I'm going to cut it like this, and then I'm going to shave off that, that bit, and we're going to build a house. And then there's a gardener, who's the one who says, oh, I'm going to plant some seeds here, and I'm going to fertilize, and I'm going to water, and I'm going to see what comes out. And arguably, you could say, oh, well, the carpenter is obviously better. Like, for perhaps the author of the dragon mother might say carpenter is better, and then other people will be like, Gar gardener is totally better. And people also say, well, being a splitter is better, and then other people are like, well, being a lumper is better. But we actually hold both of these, both we have the, the carpenter in our mind, not, not as a parental mode, we're talking about like the mind and what it can do, 
And we have the carpenter there. The carpenter is the one who helps us implement something from a plan. We can decide, we can know exactly what we need to do, we can analyze, we can do things with the carpenter mindset. And with the gardener, like, you know, you might plant to plant rose bushes one day in your mind, and they'll grow. And then another day you try to plant strawberries, and, well, they never come up. And then the next year, all you've got is weeds. And you're just like, oh, this is so frustrating. It's just weeds in my mind. And then the next year, you have strawberries again. These two mental modes both exist. They're not separate. They're both part of our mind. And I hope that during this conference, you'll have an opportunity to stretch your mind to thinking in both modes and that you'll have a fantastic time. Thank you so much for being such a great audience.